Mr. Houston, contact with a test. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. End of test. Discovery Houston, recommend uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery 4 computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Glispugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth laid in an isolated clearing a bottle of red wine, two glasses, cheese, and bread. Walking the sound of water, water. wait to cap the sound of water, or a bottle wait of Cabernet Sauvignon, set, on a, bottle of Cabernet set on a wooden tablecloth, cold water, crystal goblets, 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 crystal a flower, a flower dress, dress, unexpected woodland events, weight capped spring water in winter, a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth, cold, cold water. water, a flower dress, the smell of hops and honey, the, the smell of green in grass, a flow of stone by the river, the a smell of front green door. grass, under the eaves of the, by the river, the, the cabin where we were working, the sound of water. White-capped mountains, purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My birth takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell when that's possible in the future. At present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, 
the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres such as you know printed text where things don't move around but electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts how we perceive we're going okay we're live Astrid, do you want to start yes so welcome to the live stream reversal of Richard Smith's Genetis uh, Rhizography, hosted by the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Astrid Enslin, research affiliate of the lab and hypertext scholar, and with me remotely are Richard Smith, Mariusz Pizarski, and Dini Grieger, the director of the lab, who will be operating the computer directly from the lab. Richard will be guiding Dini remotely via Zoom while he reads from Dini's computer screen via YouTube. For the playthrough, we'll be using the CD-ROM version on a, on a G3 Power Mac running system software 9.2. Um, this software was released in June 2001 and sold through January 2002. There's a fair amount of lag in the YouTube transmission, which we apologize for, but we'll be bridging these gaps by listening to Richard's comments and, and stories. And will be um, yeah. And as a participant in the event, you will be able to post questions in the YouTube chat to the author about his work, and he will then respond in the Q and A led by Richard, Marius, Dini, and myself. Genetis: A Rhizography is a short hypertext fiction with art and design by Roy Parkhurst and Viola da Gamba variations by Webster O. Williams Jr. The work was originally published in Perforations Number no. 5, uh, 1994, and then again in Issue 2.4, 1996, of the Eastgate Quarterly Review of Hypertext. Um, in, in that particular publication, it came bundled with Robert Kendall's A Life Set for Two, a work that has been extensively documented in Dini's and her team's Rebooting Electronic Literature Volume 1. Genetis was originally produced with StorySpace 1.5, and use 616K, 261 spaces or lexias, and 344 links. It was shipped on 3.5 inch floppy disk and later on CD-ROM. According to the Eastgate catalog, it is written in the style of what Gregory Elmer calls the, the My Story. Um, uh, Smith uses the genre defying capabilities of hypertext to present a case for the power of writing in desperate circumstances, where, quote, writing has the power to salvage his sanity and his life. You will notice that Rich's writing is, is very, very personal and richly intertextual, uh, inspired by the structure of the double helix and Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, amongst many other sources, but those are very, very important. Um, my forthcoming book, Pre-Web Digital Publishing and the Lore of Electronic Literature with um, Cambridge University Press, dedicates an entire chapter to this work and situates it in the historical context of mid-1990s writing and publishing in emergent digital media. At this point, I want to acknowledge the contributions of the many staff members of the lab and faculty members of the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program who have made this event possible. Dini Grigar, who founded and directs the lab, has made it available to scholars wishing to use its many resources for the purpose of study. Greg Philbrook, the lab and program's tech guru, is handling YouTube Live and OBS. Holly Slocum, the lab's project manager, is overseeing the project and created the art associated with the event. Kathleen Zoller, the lab undergraduate researcher, is managing social media posting on Twitter. Dr. John Barber is handling the sound production. And Joel Clapp, um, a post back researcher in the lab, is taking care of post-production editing of the video capture. I will add that the video captured from today's traversal will be edited and placed on the lab's Vimeo channel and added to the lab's annual publication, Rebooting Electronic Literature. There will also be an essay written by myself that will accompany the chapter in Rebooting. So without further delay, let's begin 
the traversal. And um, if it's okay with Richard, I will turn it right over to you at this point. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, and thanks everybody for uh, coming along for the ride. Hopefully it will be a ride. And at the moment I'm watching uh, the live YouTube stream and it looks like Astrid's still talking. So but here we go. We've got a screen flickering. Uh, takes me back to the, uh, the in the way back machine here. But uh, I should mention uh, before we get started that uh, I was working on this while I was writing a dissertation for Greg Ulmer at the University of Florida. And the dissertation uh, was focused on developing a theory of hypertext composition. So the process of using story space very much came into play in the development of the theory that is outlined in the uh, the dissertation. So I believe the dissertation is available somehow uh, up on, you know, electronically somewhere in the world. So if you're interested in uh, pursuing that, uh, you could you could follow up there. So uh, this is where we begin, and I think uh, we just we can click on the screen itself to default to the first. First Lexia. And the there is a process for translating these texts into web pages, but they what we lose is the labeling of the links. And I think that's a very valuable feature of story space, and there's uh, much information that gets lost. So uh, we should be able to hear music, I think, at this point. I don't know, is, are we able to hear the music? Yes, it's coming through the YouTube. Oh, good, okay. So uh, the way the music works, I, I worked with a, a fellow grad student, Roy Parkhurst, uh, who was very much into digital media and you know, image work and, and music. So he had developed, he, he found these images in a book that was uh, written by Stefan Brecht Bertolt Brecht's son, and it was about the bread and puppet theater. And so these are images of puppets that you'll see when there's images that are integrated into the work. Uh, originally, the music was from Michael Nyman's string quartet, but when it came time to publish this with, um, with Eastgate, they were concerned about potential copyright issues. So that's when my friend Roy approached his friend, Webster Williams, who is a Viola Viol da Gamba player, and basically told him uh, the texture, uh, the feel that he was looking for when he uh, you know, chose the string quartet. So, uh, so uh, Webster Williams developed these pieces based on Roy's input, and then Roy chose uh, the pieces to go along with the images. So, and you know what Roy was seeking uh, at the time was to, to capture the emotional feel of the piece. Uh, he found the images expressionistic. Uh, he, he said that they were um, totemistic. He thought, uh, and you know, he, he just thought they looked cool. You know, that was his comment. So. And uh, Roy has a good eye for these kinds of things. So uh, these are images. I think he said they were reduced to one-bit images. So um, anyway, are you waiting for me to tell you to click? Yes. Um, then uh, go ahead and click on the image. We can uh, carry on. So the title Genesis is meant to kind of combine genesis and genetic. And uh, there is a, a myth that's written that's kind of uh, riffs off of the Genesis myth. The kind of it's like a futuristic uh, cyborg version of the Genesis myth. 
Um, but then genetic is obviously referencing the use of the uh, spiral helix, the double helix for the structure. So I, I kind of fuse those two words together. So that's why it's a, it's kind of a strange word, genetis or genetis, or uh, however you want to say that. So uh, here are the instructions. So uh, this is helping the reader. So it says, choose the open book icon from the, from the toolbar on the toolbar if you wish to see all of the path chosen choices available to you from any given cell. Some paths will take you through linear progressions that are similar to book reading. On occasion, there will be bifurcations in the path, which will allow for a choice to be made. Forks in the road will be indicated by the first word of a cell in boldface. Otherwise, the traveler can simply click on any word in the cell to trigger a default link. Three, other paths called the memory paths, starting with the memory path of dreams, will take you on a spiraling course through the text. These paths are linked to further memory paths by means of a spiral link. Four, the arrow tool will take you back to the previous cell. Five, the H tool will take you home. Uh, six, a capitalized bold-faced word will signal a link elsewhere. A lowercase bold-faced word should be regarded in the same fashion as a, an italicized word. So, Go ahead and click on uh, the background or hit enter on the keyboard. So, you know, for me at the time, I was trying to, uh, you know, how, how do we create works that, that aren't so disorienting? Uh, and, and so there were, you know, it was multi-linear, right? So there are lines, there are, um, there are paths that you can take. Uh, but then there's many forks. So, and, but then the challenge again is how do you loop it in and, and uh, make it something that's uh, something that people can actually read. So, uh, you know that was that was the challenge at the time. Uh, so here we are at the plateaus, and there's five plateaus. And you know anybody who knows the work of Deleuze and Guattari knows this is a reference to the Thousand Plateaus. Uh, the title rhizography is i think a pretty obvious uh, allusion to their chapter called the rhizome uh, the first chapter of that book and i found this uh, just very useful way of organizing the work uh, because in much of this is kind of storytelling there's the myth uh, that, that i mentioned already uh, there's a parable and allegory that are kind of about my personal life uh, kind of symbolic stories uh, the legend is about the, uh, the legend of the Florida School, which is a reference to Greg Ulmer's work, and uh, trying to set that into the future. Go ahead and click on theory, since we're, uh, that's where we're going to go first. And then theory was just trying to you know, be the, the theory of the text. So, so that's what we'll, uh, we'll, we'll proceed with that. And... Uh, you know, despite the use of the plateaus, I think I actually quote the work, uh, the work of Lacan or work about Jacques Lacan uh, more than I do Deleuze and Guattari. So, and uh, I should mention that I had a class as a graduate student at the University of Florida with Ellie Raglan Sullivan, who wrote. Um, a book about Lacan that was kind of very, very useful. Um, when the music finishes here, Dini, you can click on the back of the screen. So here, uh, Desire of the Mother is in the image. Um, and so this is kind of the theory of the work it is referencing Lacan's theory. Uh, this is from Lacan's Ecri. And the quote says, if the desire of the mother is the phallus, the child wishes to be the phallus in order to satisfy that desire. So go ahead and click on the back of the background. Um, so this quote is really captures uh, my experience. Um, when I was in the class with Raglan Sullivan, uh, it was a it, the class was called Writing in Madness, by the way, and um, I was attracted to it. Um, there was a literature in madness, something like that. I was attracted to it because I. I had a, a psychotic breakdown 
when I was uh, 20 years old, soon after being married. And um, that was, uh, you know, a pretty traumatic experience. That story is told at some point in this hypertext. Uh, the, it also includes like medical notes that, uh, that I, um, that I managed to get my hands on. And so there's, you know, direct quotes from the doctors. Um, but that, that was, uh, part of my reason for taking the class. And the, the appeal of Lacan's theory was that it explained, uh, what happened The his theory of psychosis really gave me a a solid understanding of what happened to me. So, um, so that's a part of what we'll be looking at here. This is a quote from uh, Shoshona Fellman's book, Writing and Madness, which is a book we read for that class. So this reads, uh, what philosophy thus cannot accept is a discourse that burns its way along, skipping in the process its own logical, methodological steps un discourse qui brûle ses top. For its part, philosophic discourse is defined by a demand for exhaustiveness of articulation, for articulated, thematized articulation. Even when philosophic discourse follows, as it currently does, more and more torturous paths, which, exhausting all possible detours and turns, lead nowhere, it is still, despite all its denials, based on a fundamental demand for a linear course requiring its progress to be uninterrupted and its detours to be kept in check. It is still based on a constitutive belief in the continuity and exhaustiveness of the path. Uh, please click the uh, background. Uh, so here you see a reference to you know, pathways, and this is something we think about when we're composing hypertext, having um, paths, you know, have, creating this landscape, and we're leading the reader through different pathways. Uh, it also mentions the difficulty of you know, trying to do philosophy or any kind of, you know, standard liter um, work of literacy uh, in, within a, a multilinear context, right? And I think there was even uh, a hypertext published about this called Socr Socrates in the Labyrinth, if, if I recall. I, I think that was an Eastgate publication, possibly. So. Um, anyway, so um, we're on to the next lexia here. So this is called Blinding Light. If Theoria is meant to help us see with the purpose of understanding, then the theory of this hypertext is that of a blind man groping in his own darkness. There may be light to see, but you cannot see. You must feel and smell and hear. You must be close. You must feel the breath of this text. You must share the breath of this text. It must sustain you in some way for you to know it as it is meant to be known. Go ahead and click on the background. So, um, let me just take a quick break. I gotta turn my fan off here. It turned on suddenly. Um, so, uh, this it was kind of a reference to, you know, Ulmer's first book was called Applied Grammatology, and he really helps you understand what Derrida is doing. Uh, but he talks about Derrida's uh, metaphor of, of the sight and, you know, suggests uh, a different metaphor of, of tasting and smelling uh, at, in order uh, as a metaphor of, of cognition. So uh, kind of an allusion to that. But also, you know, suggesting that, you know, this is, uh, this is a work that is very much uh, from, you know, a powerful emotional experience I had. It was uh, trying to capture and understand the, uh, what was behind the trauma. And I, I, I did it because I, I'm, here I am basically 30 years later. Uh, dealing with it, you know, in a, in a new way, uh, back in therapy, trying to figure things out. And, uh, but I had my finger on it and, and it's, it's in this, uh, it's, it's in this work. So uh, you'll find it. All right. Next Lexia here is called destination. 
It may be that this text goes nowhere, that you feel disappointed in not having arrived at any one point. But if you think about what a point is, its geometric definition, then you are always already there. Go ahead and click the background again. So there was uh, the quote from uh, Shoshona Feldman mentioned, um, you know, kind of leading nowhere, you know, having these torturous paths leading nowhere, these possible detours and turns. Uh, and that's kind of the danger when you're composing a hypertext, you know, uh, will you kind of leave the reader stranded somewhere and disoriented? Um, although, you know, as we suggest here, maybe that's the, the point. Uh, this next one's called The Path of Madness. But know this, this hypertext is the path of madness. And if it is to be truly experienced for the potential that it holds, then you must be willing to experience madness on cognitive and emotive levels. If this sounds like too much for you, then go read a book. If not, then return to the beginnings or choose the memory path of dreams for a helical tour of the hypertext. If you choose the way of the memory paths, then follow the spiral links to avoid getting lost. So what we're gonna do is go through the, the memory paths. So go ahead and click on the book, open book icon and follow the first memory path. So, And if you, um, you know, uh, much of, of what Ulmer's uh, work is about is, you know, how do we, how do we remember? Uh, how does the technologies of communication help us to remember? Um, and, you know, that's a lot of what this work is about. You're trying to remember the experience that I had. Um, also trying to theorize this, you know, how do we use hypertext? as a, uh, a kind of a, 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 a mnemography. That, that's another genre that I invented, uh, the writing of memory, mnemography. So um, you did click on memory path of dreams. Um, so uh, this is not something, we did not do this when we rehearsed it. So this is gonna be as, as much a surprise for me as it is for you because it's been 30 years since I looked at this and I can't remember exactly how I organized it. So uh, this will be something of a surprise. So it should be interesting. Um, and we're just gonna follow the memory path. So when I finish reading, you can just automatically click on the book icon and, and, and let's pause a moment and be able to read that, uh, that link to see what it's called. All right, so this is called The Place of Madness. Others have been mad. They have been mad, says Bataille, quite spectacularly. This book, in dealing with them, hopes to reflect on their place in us, on their place precisely where they have been mad in our place. To construct a theory of that place, to assume within that theory that living relationship to a place which is not mine, but which is my place. Such is my interest and desire in the book, in this book. So again, that's a quote from Shoshona Feldman. Uh, go ahead and click the book icon. And, you know, the idea here, I think, is that you know, I have been mad uh, in your place. So, um, and, you know, this is your, uh, your chance to kind of have that experience uh, to some extent or whatever, however, whatever extent that's possible. So uh, did you click the book icon, we're waiting for the link to pop up here. And uh, we see there's a number of links there, but we're gonna pass, follow the memory path of dreams we're still on, and we're gonna go to the final frontier. And, you know, essentially this is, uh, you know, the beauty of the rhizography is that it becomes this uh, you know, catch all for uh, everything that was in my mind at the time. So uh, a lot of my poetry is in here, uh, the stories, the allegories that I mentioned, um, the, the theory, the, the books about madness, um, 
you know, the writing and madness of these texts. Uh, also, I was writing about, I was reading about hypertext theory, you know, the George Landau and other works that were uh, about the question of how to do this. So, all right, the next, uh, let's see here, the final frontier. Cora, a, conceptual, a conceptualization of space found in Plato's Timaeus, offers a sense of place that does not separate inside from outside, place from that which is contained in the place. As such, it denies the typical logical common sense that A is not B. With the Cora, A equals B. This is the structure of metaphor, of analogy, of a blurring of boundaries which enables the logic of dreams, poetry, and invention. Uh, click the open book, please. So this is kind of a, a direct reference to uh, Ulmer's work. Um, he was developing his uh, uh, genre of the choreography uh, that he writes about in uh, Internet Invention. And, you know, at the time, you know, I would have these conversations with uh, Greg in his office, and, you know, we'd be talking about this and that, and uh, he steered me away from the <laughs> looking too deeply into the core because that's what he was doing um all right we're looking now we go to the spiral link so this is going to connect us and kind of click the spiral link to the mother so this is going to uh connect us to the next memory path and uh we, we've been on the memory path of dreams again you know omer's work is trying to uh, integrate uh, the right brain, uh, he sees the, the literacy as a technology of logic of the left brain. And so, you know, my work with him was to try to invent a new way to, to write, uh, where we're integrating the right brain, uh, the, the affective, the emotional, and all of that. So, um, so this Lexi is called Mother. As such, the Korah is the place of Genesis, does that say? Yes. The place of cosmologic creation, according to Plato. It is a mother always ready to nurse its young. Its breasts are filled with the milk of galaxies. White light is its liquid. I return to the mother, the muse, to drink from her many breasts. I find comfort in this analogy. Go ahead and click on the open book. So again, you know, going back to the theory, uh, the Lacan quote, uh, and you know, the key, the quote that my um, professor Raglan Sullivan mentioned uh, was, if the mother raises the child for herself rather than for the world, a psychotic structure is put into place. And you know, she explained it as, you know, a psychotic structure is uh, kind of like having a three-legged pot. So go ahead and click on the memory path of milk, and that takes us to myth four. Um, so the um, the psychotic structure of the three-legged pot, uh, Lacan writes about psychosis in, in the context of James Joyce's uh, work, and James Joyce never had a psychotic breakdown, but her claim is that the, uh, his work, his writing, his art kept him from having that psychotic breakdown. Uh, so, you know, having a psychotic structure doesn't necessarily require one to have a psychotic breakdown. Uh, the the, the three-legged pot needs to be tipped over. So in my case, the pot was tipped over. It was, you know, kind of having a shotgun wedding, being pushed into a wedding when I was basically 19 years old. And that was, uh, you know, unfortunate, but uh, that's what happened. So. Uh, so we're in the middle of the myth now, and uh, this says, And then little daddy said to Ken and Barbie, You can stay here in this junkyard, but don't open the quantums, don't neural net the inmorphation, and don't get lost on the memory paths. And they said, Okay, no problem. Uh, hit the book icon. Mm. So... Uh, if you start the myth at the beginning, uh, there's Big Daddy, there's Little Daddy, uh, Ken and Barbie are equivalent to Adam and Eve, um, and the junkyard is equivalent to the, um, you know, the, 
Garden of Eden, and you know, these uh, dictums to don't open the quantums and whatnot. Uh, th these are equivalent to you know, don't don't do this, don't do that, don't eat the apple. Uh, let's go to the memory path of milk allegory one. So, so milk is a pretty prominent uh, image in my. Uh, writing in my poetry uh, I did a lot of writing I, I think of the poetry as kind of a self therapy that I've been doing you know basically since I was a teenager and um, and you know I did it into my 40s uh, that I was still doing using this metaphor um, uh, the, and allegory one it, this is the beginning of the allegory path so it says once within a time Inside a moment, a boy with big hands was born to a mommy who had eight breasts. The mommy did not feel right unless the boy with big hands was suckling one of her eight breasts. You can click on the, the book link, please. So uh, this image came from uh, a painting that Nancy Clark did. She was a, a teacher in Gainesville somewhere. And she had this painting of a woman with eight breasts, and, and, and that just kind of struck me. Um, you know, eight illusion, possible illusion to Lacan's objet a, although I don't know enough about that theory to, you know, suggest uh, that that uh, makes sense there. So let's go the memory path of milk, allegory two. Um, notice that. Uh, there's also a link to Mother Winter, which is another poem that I wrote kind of early on in my recovery. And again, you know, this idea of self-therapy, you know, find, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, finding these images that are just, that just satisfying, they feel right, and that's where this writing comes from. Um, you know, and, and some of it's graphic and it's it's startling and it's violent, uh, but you know, it, it maybe it, it kept my three-legged pot from tipping again. I don't know. Uh, allegory two, uh, and so he suckled throughout his childhood into adolescence and even into early adulthood. You see, the mommy had so much milk to give that she was always burning for him to drink it to be nourished by her milk. Milk soon came to fill his heart as the sole form of bodily fluid. When he got a cut, he would bleed milk until it curdled, which acted the way coagulation does with blood. Then it would heal, and he would drink more milk from the mommy's breasts to fill what he had emptied. Click the book. Uh, so again, you know, this, this idea of the relationship with the mother, uh, you know, going back to that quote from Lacan, desire of the mother is the phallus the child wishes to be the phallus in order to satisfy that desire so you're trying to satisfy my mother's desire in, in early uh, therapy it was put to me like I was the little prince I was the little husband uh, the father was denigrated um, and this is the same uh, that you know Lacan found with Joyce's family situation let's go to the memory path of milk 1.4 uh, again, notice another link there to a milk poem. So uh, there's different ways you can go, but we're going to just stay on the memory paths. And again, this is, you know, kind of cutting us through the different plateaus. You know, we've, we've been into the myth. We've been into allegory. Um, much of the poetry kind of springs, uh, is organized in the allegory uh, section because that's where it made the most sense. So. Uh, this is from uh, some of my uh, poetry. I think I think it's called the Gut Meditations. Uh, so this uh, says, uh, I remember the milk of my mother. Sometimes it was white hot lava, her nipple, a small brown volcano, giving vent to the deep fire within her. And there I was to milk her, my mouth a universe to be filled by her gases as an earth formed in my belly. Click the book icon, please. So again, you know, it's, it's not pretty poetry, uh, <laughs> but you know, um, it, 
it kind of captured the the intensity of trying to navigate uh, this relationship with her, and, and, and not just with her, but how it shaped the way I related to uh, people in general and, and mostly women. Uh, let's go to Memory Path of Milk 1.5. So, you know, again, uh, the idea of, you know, ex experiencing that trauma of this dysfunctional uh, family. You know, my father was alcoholic. Uh, and, you know, basically I'm discovering neglectful and I was essentially abandoned in my childhood. Uh, I think a lot of us were. It was just the way things were back then. Um, uh, 1.5. Now I am desperate for milk. I gather grass and squeeze it for milk. Paint, white paint. I will drink it like milk. The tight brown nipple, fist nipple, and I gnawing at her knuckles. And so I learn how to grind my bones into milk. I heat my skin until it evaporates, then capture it as milk. Mushrooms perfect and milky are my prey. Get the book icon, please. The, um, I haven't read this poetry for quite a while, so it's uh, it's intense. <laughs> it's intense to read it. I mean, I wrote it, but it's just intense to read it. Um, the Memory Path of Milk, please. I think this is going to jump us into the parable, which is a kind of different kind of symbolic story that I tell about, you know, how I relate to women um, as a result of uh, this trauma of this relationship with my mother. Um, so, and the a parable uh, story is the, the lexia are broken out. So the word, uh, it, parable is spelled and it's kind of spelled as a uh, but it's but it's also a blending of, of a word a para um, parabola parabolarable something like that so it's kind of strange um, so this is a his problem is that he never knew who he was he never had any fix on his face every time he looked in the mirror he saw the face of another some other face that his mother had made Book icon, please. Um, so again, uh, this is you know me kind of really capturing you know, what what this uh, does. Um, it, it's really kind of a, an issue of identity, um, and you know I'm, uh, let's go to the memory path of milk 1.3. I think is that what that is? Yeah, 1.3. Um, so we're going to kind of jump back into the poetry, uh, it looks like. But um, the parable kind of tells that story in a in more uh, in-depth way, so to speak. Um, and... So this is 1.3, I think it is. As with the suicide boy, I grow tired of all these mirrors, all these glory-eyed mannequins still within their windows. I am scared of our burstings, for we are one in our vacuity. Click the book icon. So this is the suicide boy is a direct reference to Joe Bolton, who was a uh, very quite successful poet who was a grad student at the time when I was there, and um, he was, uh, you know, published already with the reputable publications, and so th that's kind of was the path I wanted to be on, so he was, you know, uh, quite successful, but uh, he turned out to be, I, I think he had maybe the same issues with, uh, with intimacy that I did, uh, memory path of milk please. 
Um, and uh, so, so the, the, this part of the poetry here references um, his, a poem that's, his poem that's part of this work where he's looking at mannequins and he's just uh, frustrated with the difficulties between men and women. And you could, and it was close to when he actually committed suicide. He was quite young, he was 29 or something like that. So, uh, and you know, when I found that out, it was uh, kind of startling for me because I thought, you know, that's a poem I could have written. And, uh, and that made me think, yeah, maybe I'm, uh, I could be suicidal myself. And I have had suicidal ideation and uh, you know, have been dealing with that in, in therapy past and present. So this next lexi is called avoidances. And this is what is painful, sometimes too painful to live with. The, this constant repetition and this realization that it will go on and on without end, such that the psychotic is, ne the psychotic is never filled. Um, and that, that was, that's what's hard. You go ahead and click the book icon and we'll carry on. That's what's hard about revisiting this work is because um, I've been living with this, you know, since I wrote this. Um, I've been in recovery from alcoholism for 30 years. And I wrote this when I was about three years sober. So I was, you know, coming out of that. But um, this, you know, this love addiction, which essentially is what it is, I think, uh, gets set up with um, a psychotic structure. Um, I've been living with this for, for 25 years and, you know, didn't really know it and it's just recently that I'm kind of getting a handle on it uh, so okay we're gonna take a spiral link and get out of this memory path of milk <laughs> might make you happy um, <laughs> so let's take a spiral link to the dilemma anyway there's a lot more poetry uh, you know that's you know, a lot more kind of details about that the poetry a lot of it is um, it's called gut meditation so it's kind of like you know, dealing with that emotional gut level stuff. Uh, the the poetry uses um, uh, mixtures like uh, I, I imagine the four elements: earth, air, water, fire. And when they mix, uh, what happens? So earth plus water is mud. Earth plus fire is lava. Earth uh, uh, air plus water is bubble. Um, air plus earth is sandstorm or dust. So um, the idea of mixing and the mixtures, uh, this idea of um, the self mixing with others or kind of blending, becoming blended with others. Uh, because, you know, not having my own identity, essentially, you know, I'm looking for myself in, in others. Uh, so here's the dilemma. Such is the dilemma of the psychotic. He defines himself in relation to others. Commitment to any one person is too threatening because it reiterates the relationship to the mother. So any relationship to an other becomes the relationship to the mother. And this is what the psychotic is constantly trying to avoid. Let's click on the book icon. Uh, so again, you know, this has been my dilemma a good long time. Uh, did, did that, did I hear something? Yes, sound will come on. Oh, yeah. Did it say something like, uh, that at some point, let me know when um, it says, if it says no more philosophical bullshit? Yeah, that wasn't this one. It was uh, a word I couldn't understand, but it's definitely your voice. Okay. I didn't know that I, I, I had other recordings. I thought that was the only kind of um, voice. So... All right, so this takes us into uh, the evaluation. These are uh, direct quotes from the, the notes of the doctors that I was working with uh, when I was uh, you know, hospitalized, basically, for the psychosis, the psychotic breakdown. So um, this is medical evaluation, June 26, 1984. Uh, there had been some family dysfunction. His parents have been separated his father being an alcoholic he went from high school to college where he is now a sophomore he has had a close relationship with his mother at times it appears that this might have been more intimate than usual but not abnormal at times his mother thought his thinking and speech were somewhat bizarre 
but she attributed it to his intellectual abilities. That's the word I think that came up before, bizarre. Bizarre, it kind of rings mm. out like that. Yeah. So yeah, that's, I think that's uh, what it that, was. Yeah, kind of direct um, reference to that. So yeah, there, there's these occasions where I, I have the voice um, speak up, speak in. Um, so hopefully we'll get to one, sorry, if you click the book icon and uh, we'll carry on with the memory path, or I think, where are we? What's the memory path we're on now? Are we still spiral linking along here? This is the memory path of what? Madness? Nothing to sneeze at. Madman. Madman. Uh, the memory path of Madman. Okay, so um, so now we're on the memory path of Madman, and that's hence the uh, the notes uh, that we're looking at here. So, uh, clinical notes, June 27, 1984. How dull liquid concentrate five milligrams was given again an hour or so later, and the patient tried to put his fingers in the medication and on the medication. By now, was sweating profusely. He resumed mumbling, pacing the floor and hitting the walls. For his own protection, he was placed in restraints. By this time, midnight had passed, and the patient appeared on 624 84 230 a.m. to look toxic and confused. Uh, he was seen by a doctor on call, apparently had had a seizure at 2.40 a.m. on 6.24.84, which was observed by the nurse on duty with the back arched, head extended, and mild clonic movements over the entire body, lasting approximately 60 seconds for a period of ap apnea and then forceful blowing type respirations following. He blew foamy saliva at least six inches up into the air. His eyes were closed during the seizure. They had been open previously. He did not avoid during the seizure. Click on the book icon. So uh, here we get the you know very specific details of the trauma. I, I do remember having my back arching, my tongue swollen. Uh, at some point, there was this kind of weird dream uh, vision I had, and I don't know if we'll get to see that, but it is embedded in the hypertext at some point. And the vision was of a serpent being like tortured by aliens to learn how to talk. Let's, let's follow the memory path of Mad Men, please. Um, so the serpent is writhing in pain. Uh, his tail is making an S sound. Uh, and you know, I, I kind of firmly believe that that I developed a story to kind of manage the suffering my body was going through, um, uh, because they, you know, they were told to my, my friends were told not to leave the state because if I died, they would be under investigation because they thought they basically pushed drugs on me. Case um, notes continued. He was transferred. Then, by stretcher to Ward 053, our medical ward for observation and evaluation, and from that point, was subsequently transferred after developing high fever of 104 degrees back to Smith County Community Hospital. Smith with a Y, that's the way my name is spelled, by the way. Um, by 6 p.m. on the same day, patient's body became very rigid and he made gestures with hands and face in a trance-like state. He also made bizarre-like sounds. Mother was contacted on phone. She became hysterical, crying, begging us to get a neurologist to do a spinal tap for encephalitis, etc., and asked us to please consider other than drug-related problems. She was uh, assured. Sorry? Assured. She was assured that these things would be considered. Nonetheless, no spinal tap was done, no EEG, no CAT scan, and no other neurological work ups other than the reflex and sensory testing which is part of the routine physical examination. Uh, click the book icon in advance on the memory path. Um, yeah, so what was interesting was they did a drug test on me and when it came back negative they, they sent me out of the state to Johnson City Medical Center where uh, they took me off the Haldol and I was better in like a matter of days and left and have been fine ever since. Um, so I think there was a potential lawsuit there. Um, memory path of madman. Uh, but if, interestingly enough, when we went to do 
you know, contact the lawyer, and he was all excited. But when he found out I was back in grad school doing okay, he was like, oh, there's no case here. We have to show uh, permanent damage for, for a suit to be able to go through. All right, this one's titled War. He was seen lying in bed with medical restraints and with his tongue protruding and drooling. He could not withdraw his tongue into his mouth. The tongue was still swollen and bruised from his earlier seizure. Look the book icon. So again, you know, I, my tongue was swollen, I think maybe from biting on it, um, but that was you know, part of this vision I had with the serpent uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 the tongue hissing and sticking out of the mouth. Um, now the other thing to kind of know is that uh, just the, pr the previous month, following the memory path of Madman, the previous month I had been on honeymoon to Chichen Itza in Mexico, where uh, if you know that structure, it um, it will send light through the upper chamber, which is um, uh, on, on the solstice days, uh, or equinox, um, and the light projects a shadow that goes down the diagonal uh, paths, and it meets up with the serpent head at the bottom. Unbelievable. Right, they could do that, and and it's symbolizing the serpent diving deep into the ground to fertilize the earth. So, this vision of me as a serpent uh, was uh, set in the desert. You know, I think that's significant, right? It kind of shows you that I was probably thinking about what I learned about the serpent, which I thought was startling, given you know, my awareness of you know, gen Genesis and um, Christian use of serpents as uh, evil and devil and whatnot. All right, we're back to poetry here. 8.3. I want to be a universe, a single poem, a word spoken by a god, but I am the prophet of psychosis. I can only speak of shattering and fragments, of the nothingness of vacuum, the roiling pit where all guts churn, trying to separate and then to mingle just once and for all with a single element. I want to be satisfied. I want. Put the uh, book I come to. And yeah, this kind of follows uh, coming off of the you know the memory path of, of Mad Men. So another one that's called Memory Path of Mad Men. And so you can see how I'm uh, using the, this idea of the helical structure to kind of tie together parts of the text that uh, otherwise wouldn't, you know, come into play. But um, also trying to, you know, point out the connections between these different uh, allegories, stories, myths, the theory, the Lacan, and all of that, which hypertext allows us to do. Yay, hypertext. Um, I think this is, what, number nine? Um, and this, uh, there is a sequence, a numbered sequence, that tells the story of the being on the honeymoon and having a breakdown and stuff. So this is part of that sequence. After my psychotic breakdown, they strapped me up in an ambulance and took me to Smith County Hospital. Well, let's click the book icon, please. So I'm, I vividly recall being... Uh, you know, after the breakdown, I was fine. Um, I probably would have been fine, but then they, you know, they hospitalized me. Uh, but I remember them telling me, oh, you're in Smith County Hospital, S-M-Y-T-H, you know, and I thought, <laughs> oh, they're just trying, probably trying to humor me because I just had a breakdown, and, you know, that's what they do to crazy people. Um, uh, the Memory Path of Mad Men, please, and then take us to chaos. So the capital word here in the Lexia makes me think we're heading into the, the legends section, which is where I, I, I capitalized the, um, the Lexia there. And that's where I talked very directly about, you know, kind of uh, the Florida school, uh, Omer's theory, and um, also specifically about a hypertext um, and kind of hypertext composition and uh, the theory of hypertext composition. So, uh, this one is called Chaos. 
the speech of psychotics or closes or sorry becomes metonymically substituted the, this means that words and sentences are substituted for one another and follow after one another as a result of phonetic and semantic similarities and continuities let's click the book icon please and follow the memory path or the spiral link I think there's five memory paths in total if I recall I, mean, I can't uh, can't remember exactly but we'll, we'll see um, we're only about an hour in so I think we're we might be able to get through all the memory paths which we did so we're following the memory path of Mad Men. Uh, so here with this chaos lexia, you know, again, back to the kind of theory, uh, talk about metonyms, whatnot, right? This is called indirect quotes. In many schizophrenic texts, the, meta, the, the metonymies abound. They are both semantic and syntactical in nature. Moreover, they are in a very direct manner connected with the ways the uh, unconscious functions, with the way the unconscious functions, in that they consist of a number of phenomena of linguistic similarity and continuity, in which it is possible to recognize displacement and uh, non. I can't read that. Non compensation. Sorry. Compensation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So those are kind of allusions to, I think. Um, Freudian or Lacanian theory, you know, um, and you know, trying to think about what happens to language uh, with madness. And this was part of what we were studying in the Raglan Sullivan class, uh, which was, uh, it was called Literature and Madness. So, uh, sorry, I clicked the book icon, yep, and we're going to follow the memory path of madness to indirect quota. So as I was composing, I was constantly trying to think, you know, how do I incorporate some of this theory stuff and create these little pathways, uh, loops, uh, where we could kind of loop from the poetry or the stories and loop into the theory and come out. So if you traverse the text in different ways, uh, you might find different ways I did that. So uh, this is called indirect quota. In schizophrenic speech, quotations break through unmarked and unanchored so uh, and I think you know when you hear this word bizarre kind of come come out and uh, the other phrase that we may not get to hear uh, um, it'll say no more philosophical bullshit and it will say that uh, in I think three different ways sorry click the book icon and uh, carry on with the memory path uh, the memory path of madness uh, sorry, the, um, the this phrase, no more philosophical bullshit, um, follow the memory path of madness. So, uh, that, that's what my mother said to me when uh, we were, I was done, we were on our way home, and you know, she kind of very sternly uh, turned to me with her finger and she said, no more philosophical bullshit. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was, you know, what, 20 years old and I was, you know, heading into a masters and a PhD at the University of Florida where I was reading Derrida and Toulouse and that's all I've been doing ever since but um, she was you know obviously very uh, scared and thought that that's what caused uh, all of this and yeah that was part of it you know I was very much into the ideas um, uh, and excited very excited I was very intense though, when I was young younger so um, and that's uh, part of it. Uh, when I was on the honeymoon, I was reading uh, Heinrich Zimmer about mythology. I was learning about Chichen Itza and you know, serpents as uh, fertility symbols. And then, you know, the joke is I read uh, Faulkner's Sound and the Fury coming home to relax. <laughs> so, uh, so this, uh, this lexi is called Continued. So this is the second part of the poem I alluded to before by Joe Bolton. Um, uh, it says here, walking here endlessly in a black dress, shadows, shadow lost among the shadows of palms on this square that 
failed blocks from the sea. I have run out of life. From what? I have run out of life from the repetition of our moving only from mirror to mirror, catching our reflections in shop windows and finding them less real than mannequins. Joe Bolton. This was published in Tampa Review 3, and I believe it was published shortly after he killed himself, because uh, when I met the professor, put the book icon, please, in advance uh, on the memory path. When I met the professor who published it, she was a former professor of mine at the University of Tampa. Uh, she's the one who told me that he killed himself. And, uh, and again, you know, this look at the language there. Um, I have run out of life. He, he was obviously very close to committing suicide. You know, and why has he run out of life? From the repetition of these women, these mannequins, these women who become mannequins, they're, they're unreal, right? Uh, follow the memory path of madness. So, so that's that was kind of what I was grappling with at the time. Like that was, I understood that um, you know I had a, a love addiction, you know, it's called codependence, I think, uh, in different twelve-step programs. Um, but anyway, um, that you know, he seemed to be dealing with the same uh, issues, and to have him kill himself find that out it was pretty intense for me so uh okay this is back to the parable you can see i think that's a letter b so this is about uh joe bolton so it says his friend couldn't take it anymore he killed himself with a big phallic gun to prove his manhood blew his brains out on the threshold of his woman's house at the border between inside and outside uh, click the book icon and on the, met, the memory path. So, yeah, he literally uh, like brought his gun to his girlfriend's apartment and she opened the door and he just killed himself in the doorway. Like, un, you know, unbelievable. Just uh, yeah, to, to, to kind of bring that trauma, to, you know, to, into somebody else's life, you know. Um, so we're going to take the spiral link to Cyborgan. So we're going to get off of that memory path. Uh, again, maybe uh, we'll be happy because that was kind of intense. Um, and Cyborgan looks like, you know, it's going to be probably a reference to Donna Haraway, uh, Cyborgs, and it might be a quote about, you know, inside and outside, liminality, all that stuff. I can't remember the theory, uh, but she was pretty popular back then. Uh, cyborg, but cyborg, and Donna Haraway speaks of the cyborg as between genders. This chapter is an argument for pleasure in the confusion of boundaries and for responsibility in their construction. It is also an effort to contribute to so socialist feminist culture and theory in a postmodernist, non naturalist mode and in the utopian tradition of imagining a world without gender which is perhaps a world without gen genesis. Uh, genesis, but maybe mm -hmm. also a world without end. Um, I'm not sure where that quote comes from. We'd have to follow the citation. Um, though she later says that, quote, the most terrible and perhaps the most promising monsters in cyborg worlds are embodied in non-edible narratives with a different logic of repression, which we need to understand for our survival. Uh, one might argue that the psychotic is a kind of psychic cyborg to begin with, insofar as the psychotic structure, as Lacan theorizes, it positions the psychotic subject in between genders in a state of transsexuality. I think that's just a citation to Donna Haraway, so but let's not waste time uh, following up on that. Yeah, it is, it is from the manifesto, yes. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, let's click the book, book icon, and, and we'll, we'll be on a new memory path now. Um, and interesting references to non-edible narratives, because obviously Lacan is is uh, invested in the edible narrative. Now we're going to go to the memory path of hybrid. So let's follow that. Um, and, you know, Deleuze and Guattari and Anti-Oedipus are also, you know, trying to undermine that kind of 
devotion to the Oedipal narrative, so there's a, kind of an interesting uh, conflict between those two um, theorists, you know, kind of undermining the work. So following the memory path of hybrid now, I think, going to uh, between. So this is the capitalized uh, lexia, which I believe go back to the legend section. So this says... And this is going to be a quote from uh, Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, a rhizome has no beginning or end. It is also always in the middle, between things, interbeing, intermezzo. The middle is by no means an average. On the contrary, it is where things pick up speed. Between things does not designate a localizable relation, given giving from one thing to the other and back again, but a perpendicular direction, a transversal movement that sweeps one and the other away, a stream without beginning or end that undermines its banks and picks up speed in the middle. So uh, let's click the book icon and follow the memory path of hybrid. So um, this was part of what I thought was interesting about story space as a medium for composing hypertext because it allowed for the very fast development of the lexia and you could kind of quickly you know, pop some text in and then, you know, organize very rapidly. So following the memory path of hybrid there. So, um, so part of my theory was that speed was part of the, the, my theory of hypertext, like doing it fast and like following intuition and just like letting the composition flow. Um, and, you know, it, it came out of that Deleuze chapter, the rhizome, uh, and there's a, a quote that didn't make it in there. Uh, Speed turns the point into a line, which uh, I love that quote. Um, I have a great uh, admiration for and desire to know and understand math, and I think about geometry all the time. Um, so that kind of underlies uh, some of the appeal of used and you know I think uh, there's a, a, a you know a, a path kind of to thinking about composition in three-dimensional and more uh, n-dimensional spaces which uh, the electronic medium allows so let's read this desire and so we have one primary function of the rhizography as a genre the capa its capacity to equalize all levels of discourse it's bringing to the surface where all, all those shallow discourses like jokes, riddles, anecdotes, comic books, and other popular genres reside, those disciplinary discourses of depth to share the same status. So um, kind of equalizes those. At any point, one can skate from a Lacan quote into a comic book panel depicting some Lacanian concept or from some frivolous poem to the heart of theory. Let's click the book icon. So again, this is in the, the legend plateau, and uh, this is where I'm kind of talking about Ulmer's theory, and because I was working with Greg Ulmer, yeah, let's follow that, and you know, trying to think about, uh, you know, his whole thing, Ulmer's whole thing is, how do we invent new uh, practices, uh, new institutional practices? new genres. I mean, look at, look at his work. You know, he developed the choreography, he developed my story, he developed the consult. Uh, it's hard to keep up with him. He's always creating some, some new thing. He's still at it, too. He's retired, and uh, but he's still going. He's amazing. Uh, Energizer bunny kind of guy, you know? Uh, all right, so like genes, this one's called. Uh, now it becomes possible for Florida school practitioners to tell their stories, to expose the subjective behind the objective, to allow their interests to become part of their work. Now it becomes possible to weave discourses from the disciplinary sphere, such as Lacan's explanation of the psychotic structure, for instance, within the anecdotal discourse of the home. So, for instance, one who has had a psychotic breakdown can talk about this in the subjective mode of the historical, rather than having to veil this personal aspect by objectively talking about Kleist or Joyce in an academic journal article. This latter medium encourages 
acts of prosopopoeia, by which the critic wears the mask of the author and or the character about whom he, she has written in order to write about his or herself. I'll click the book icon. So this is kind of a direct allusion to uh, the work of Paul DeMond. I think he talks about prosopopoeia and um, prosopopoeia is like a, a trope of literacy, right? And Homer's all about uh, developing uh, electricity and genres of electricity. Um, so, and, and the idea of hiding behind, follow the memory path of hiding things. The idea of hiding behind, you know, our work to, to really do what we really want to do, which is like work through our emotional trauma or whatever happens to be going on in our life, you know, as scholars. You know, I, I just wonder how many scholars uh, have had to do that, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, not be able to, like, just be out there with it. Um, so I think that's the advantage of electricity, uh, where we're allowed, we're kind of allowed to do this. We're allowed to integrate with the right brain with the left brain. So, um, and let me just mention one anecdote before we move on from that. Um, I did do a conference presentation. Uh, it was about Edmund Spencer. Edmund Spencer's in the dissertation also. Um, and uh, I actually had this cardboard cutout and I had this cutout and I had my face sticking through and Edmund Spencer's face was all over it. And I like read the paper sticking my face through this thing. So. Uh, and it, inspired by uh, Greg Omer's, um, you know, basically his first work, Applied Grammatology, which is where you know, he, he uh, argues for the need to perform, right? And, and, and performance makes something memorable, right? You do something slightly different, and people are going to remember what you did, right? They might think it's weird, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll remember. So, um, and I think maybe during that presentation, I was able to talk about that. But the presentation was about Prosa Papaya in Edmund Spencer. So it was kind of like, you know, trying to say, you know, look at me. I am becoming Edmund Spencer. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, I think, what many scholars do maybe. Uh, or, you know, have similar experience to mine. Maybe they're, they're adopting their uh, subjects as masks to wear as they kind of go through their, you know, whatever they're, they're dealing with. So, all right, let's read this next one. This is called Richard, Now. Richard, Sorry. just briefly, um, yeah, is, is it possible to, to have this as the last lexia that you're reading and then move on to Q&A? Is that okay? Or would you like to to share one more or so? Um, uh, let's, if you don't mind, if we could just maybe follow one after this, let's, um, Yep. And okay. So, okay, so let's see what this says. Now, uh, the question is this, can we do the work of personal recovery at the same time we are doing the work of scholarly research? When the boundaries separating what is research from what is personal are crossed, this is the effect of hypertext formats, the crossings. This is the joining of two strands of institutional narrative, much like the joining of DNA of what comes together are those things that are traditionally kept apart, such that hybrids are formed. Remember, every individual expression of genetic engineering is a hybrid. This might be a good place to end. Let's see what the next link would take us to anyway, just to see uh, where that would go. Um, click the book icon. And Yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm not sure like how uh, where the memory paths would continue to take us. I, I can't I can't tell you that because I, I didn't have the um, I didn't have that. So it looks like we're back into the poetry with 5.2. So yeah, let's let's stop there. I think you you got a good taste of um of what this is all about, and um, hopefully we can you know get this available so that people can look at it. I, I understand there might be some copyright issues or something like that, but uh, I really, I, I like the idea of people reading it and studying it. That 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 helps me um, with uh, you know appreciating that you know that everything I've gone through and, and being able to put it together and uh, that, that it might make some kind of contribution 
some may have mentioned but. that Richard, all of this video that we're collecting today will be put into the um, Rebooting Electronic Literature Volume 4. So at some level, people will have access to everything you've read and all this um, interaction between you and the computer captured today. So there's that. And so also you sent me the words to this, and I think that might be something that we can talk about in terms of copyright. That might be yours to, to keep. It depends mm -hmm. on your contract. So in the case of Richard Holton, he was able to re redo his work based on the copyright. So anyway, we can talk more about that, but it's certainly we're, that's the point of this exercise today is to make this available to people. Great. Okay, so I guess we're ready for uh, questions. Um, so I see a lot of like chat stuff happening, but um, hopefully someone can feel like send me questions. Um, yes, I usually moderate the Q and A, and Astrid and Marius are going to be asking you questions from us. So I think uh, Astrid, do you want to start? Um, with a question that I have. Yeah. Or a question <laughs> that I find in the chat. I mean, the chat has been beautiful. I mean, so people are so excited. Just to summarize, Richard, um, it's been a highly engaged chat. And <laughs> so I hope people will be able to say a bit more about um, just the associations that they had listening to you and reading this beautiful prose and poetry work. Um, I mean, I'm just amazed uh, at how just how teachable this work is. And, and of course, also the way in which you perform it. I mean, I think in this particular case, the performance is, is absolutely key i mean it sounds like you were it's a show but it's not it's really you're working through the the work but at the same time your life and it's just incredible um, um so i mean coming uh, coming from a position um where I'm, I'm i'm very intrigued at those um you know terms that that Albert coined and that you wove into this narrative um i'm just really curious to hear a bit more about that relationship and how it influenced the genesis of, of this work and was it like was it more um, of a staggered approach or did you have everything to start with and and you know you, you wrote it all up or you know I'm just interested in the in the genesis of this work <laughs> and, and the role that Alma and others in the Florida school had in it yeah um, and I didn't catch what you said about this something stabbered or staggered 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 oh yeah 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 so Sorry. Um, you know, so I call Ulmer's, uh, his uh, educational process, I call it the chaos theory of education, um, because, you know, my, ex my exams were not traditional exams. Uh, so my, my first exam, I was reading uh, Spencer criticism. Then the second exam, I was reading a literary theory. And then the third exam, I was reading all kinds of things. I read postmodern educational theory. I read, uh, you know, Giraud and Aronowitz. I read uh, Minsky's Society of Mind. I read Papert, um, the the children's. Uh, I can't remember the title, but the Papert's work. Um, and it was just like all over the map. It was it was about neurology. It was about uh, artificial intelligence. So it was so exciting, uh, and and I, I think he's he's a brilliant educator, an absolutely brilliant educator. Um, so so the idea is, you know, you kind of you, you, you throw these three different uh, things together, and like, what's going to happen? You know, like they, they explode, and like what comes out of it? And you know, the dissertation is what came out, and it was the you know I think of it as this kind of hybrid monster. But, you know, because I start with Edmund Spencer, but, you know, Spencer is a example of, of print literacy at the end of, you know, um, at, at, you know the, the, shortly after the emergence of the printing press. So uh, Ulmer talks about technologies of, of communication and how they influence and have an effect on, you know, thinking of, um, you know, the, these as prosthetics for the mind, right? Um, so, so with my work with him, the idea was, how does hypertext become a prosthesis for our brain, 
body. And, you know, if I'm reading about like, neuroscience uh, and, you know, rhizomes, it's like this is this is how the brain is structured, right? So, um, so But, you was, know, sorry to interrupt here, but this is, this is very precious because, like, it's not like the brain. It's a prosthesis. It, it's not, you know, a lot of people at the time were, were theorizing that, you know, hypertext is almost like an exact embodiment or something like that of the brain, but it can't be, and it, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, you know, memory and learning happen quite quite linear, <laughs> in, a, in a very linear way. So I, I love that that metaphor as a prosthesis. Sorry to interrupt there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's one of his, uh, his kind of key words. So, um, and yeah, so, and I think, you know, Story Space came out and I got a copy of it, and, and then, so I started to experiment. While I'm doing my research, while I'm trying to, you know, figure out what I'm going to write and how I'm going to write this thing, and you know, it kind of evolved slowly because uh, I, you know, it was different hit or miss. You know, I'd bring him a proposal and he'd say, you know, that it's not going to work. Of course, I was working with three or four other professors, you know, who also had a say, and they were all like Renaissance scholars. Um, so, you know, one guy was a theorist who was, you know, young, very uh, John Merchick. He was uh, incredibly intelligent, you know, knew the Lacan, knew the Deleuze, uh, and, uh, but very young and trying to figure out how to be on a dissertation committee, <laughs> you know, with other uh, elders and, and whatnot. So it was all that stuff was going on, like, you know, the politic, the politics and yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, so that was um, that was the genesis, I guess you would say, of how that worked. And um, and you know, the interesting thing is, I was hired. I only had like one chapter finished, and I got hired at Hamlin University. So I had to like get on the ball and write this thing in the last couple months, and. At the time, my father was dying of cancer, and um, shortly after he died, my first wife told me she wanted a divorce, and she was taking my five-year-old twins and moving out in a week. And at that point, I had one month to finish. So it was like, you know, and I was like, you know, three years sober and uh, trying, having to deal with that. So, but you know, again, Homer was just incredibly helpful because what he said was what do you have control over <laughs> you don't have a control over any of that stuff but you have control over getting this work done so I was able to keep focused and get the work done and finish the degree at the end of the summer and have the PhD in hand when I got the job so yeah so he you know I think Omer has emotional intelligence just fundamentally if you talk to him he's just a he's just a great guy you know he's just very personable and easy to talk to but he's unbelievably smart and intelligent he's just a genius he's an absolute genius so i should probably get off that because I'll, I'll go on about him so I'll, i want to stop there it's very valuable though i think that that's very important that we, yeah. we appreciate he's this. uh he's, he's he's brilliant uh, and the uh, batons have called him the aristotle of electricity and He's absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So while okay, we are at the, go ahead, sorry. Like, yeah. Oh, thank you. While we are at the genesis of the genetics, uh, you then published uh, the work in perforations, something that Aswit uh, mentioned in the introduction. It is 1994, and then there is a second publication in 1996 uh, by Eastgate, which uh, we are reading now. Uh, are there big differences between uh, these two publications? You, do you still call them the same uh, work, or uh, the differences are quite uh, significant? Uh, good question. Um, it, they're pretty much, they're very similar. Um, basically, uh, I just sent to, to Dini and, and Astrid the letter from Diane Greco, uh, and the, you know everything she asked me to change. She, she was very specific, went through. Uh, I'd say the, the major difference is that they wanted me to have citations um, and, you know, make it like a scholarly thing. So so all the, the, the citation links, those are new in the Eastgate uh, version. But for the most part, 
the the meat of the text of the hypertext is the story everything there is the same uh, there might be little parts where uh, I broke one Lexia into two or three uh, just to, to make it easier to flow better but um, and you'll see uh, I also sent to her and I think it's going to be archived the, the text the printout of the, the whole hypertext so uh, you'll see where there were some uh, Lexia that were untitled and I cross them out and I give them a name because in the, the new version uh, Diane Greco asked me to name all the Lexia so but you can you can track uh, exactly the thing she asked me to do and I even have my notes where I said yeah I checked it off yeah I made that I changed that maybe I had a question in the margin so uh, happily I, I kept all that stuff I've noticed one thing and one, one, one advice that you perhaps did not follow entirely uh, Diane in these notes from the editor uh, ask you to put some more text links uh, whereas your idea as, as we have seen here was more to write in paths like memory paths uh, uh, showed us quite quite well yes yeah and exactly you know the again the the because I, I did other experiments and I, I did them uh, I'm not sure when but you know like I did this like web thing with five by five grid and everything was connected to everything else and you know that that unfortunately has been lost it, it was published in some kind of publication it might be in the wayback machine or something I don't know but um, but anyway the point is that you know trying these different methods you know, and the, the goal being how do we make this make some kind of sense because it's easy to just become a hodgepodge right so um, it really is a challenge you know, how do you take a fundamentally singular path which literacy requires and uh, turn that into uh, like a landscape of uh, of a text and then that landscape can be entered at any point so I think this is probably still a problem you know how do we do this uh, maybe it's why hypertext hasn't been adopted more widely as a kind of scholarly medium uh, but I think you know the potential is there still so but if we have fewer links <laughs> there's no path you know and thinking about it as a landscape, you know, and, and really considering the reader, right? It's, it's being considerate, ultimately. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yes, thank you. I think we have some questions in the chat, um, especially from, from Richard Snyder. Dee, do you want to take those? Yes, yeah, so Richard Snyder, he's a PhD candidate at Washington State University. And he's uh, now, uh, we'll be making this official Jul uh, July 1st, but he's the assistant director of the Electronic Literature Lab um, very soon. So we're very excited about that. So he asks, thank you so much, Richard. I'm wondering how the hypertextual nature of this work versus print affected the process of revisiting it for you. I'm thinking of the fact that you, sp you spoke to yourself audibly from the past. Also, the idea of being lost in your own previous thoughts Lexia Paz. Mm, yeah. Um, well, so that's interesting because I did have a hypertext version of this that was converted into HTML, and uh, I had the printout. So when I was asked to do this traversal, I, I, I knew that if I wasn't familiar with what the general layout of it was, that the reading would kind of be a mess, that it could it could be a mess. Um, so I wanted to take us through in a way that would make some sense. And, you know, actually, we did the practice last week, and it was very different. Uh, I we went straight through after the theory uh, plateau. We did the parable plateau in its entirety with a loop through uh, the, the story. And then I think at the end of that, I took us through the myth plateau. Uh, and it was a very different feel, you know. I think the, the people who were there, 
will um, will attest to that. That it was it was I think much heavier. It was a uh, maybe more depressing. <laughs> maybe that's just <laughs> for me because you know I was revisiting uh, like you said um, in the question. So my goal was to not be lost <laughs> in order to make this. Uh, uh, traversal that would be of use because this is this may be the only um, archiving of work, especially if the uh, copyright issues don't get worked out. So, so yeah, I, I, if there's a follow up there, I'll, I'll take it. I'm not sure that thoroughly answered the question. Ashley, may I ask him a question? Previously, yeah. yeah. Before we started this traversal, you and I were talking, Richard, about um, Sherry Turkle's book, The Empathy Diaries, that I just finished. And I mentioned to you that she integrated her experiences, starting as a young child and her memories, into her intellectual work at, you know, at, at various Radcliffe and then on to MIT where she got tenure eventually. And that corresponds a lot to what you're doing here. And she herself went through psychoanalytic theory, you know, um, that, you know, um, ther therapy, study Lacan, Deleuze, all of that, and talks about that in her book. So it's striking to me the similarities between your life and hers, and that kind of um, integration of emotion, feelings with intellectual. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be... <laughs> Uh, compared to Cherry Turkle, that's great. Um, and I was mentioning to you uh, The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson as a kind of auto theory memoir, so where she's quoting Lacan and Deleuze and Judith Butler and all these other thinkers. So, and I know there was some movement of uh, called like, um, confessional criticism, I think yeah. it was the late 90s. Yeah. Um, so there have been, you know, it's like little, uh, you know, forays into this kind of integration, uh, and you know, I think it's it can only be good. And you know, the other thing I recognize is that as I kind of do therapy in the 21st century, there is much more understanding of the effect of trauma on the body how memories are stored in the body, preserved in the body, and that that's, that's where you have to do the work of, of healing. And it has to be at that level. And, you know, and there's other ways, uh, there's other kind of um, therapy. There's one called the internal family systems, which I'm uh, also doing, where you, you kind of, you try to, find these voices uh, within yourself, these characters, and you name them, and you kind of picture them, you know, so a lot of that kind of postmodern uh, theory and whatnot, post-structuralist theory, uh, seems to be coming into play to some extent in, you know, the actual realm of psychotherapy, so, but, you know, I think just in general, as a culture, as a society, we are beginning to understand how trauma works and you know, how to deal with it, how to, how to get people to heal. And, you know, the various uh, crises with addiction, we see with opiates and whatnot, and, you know, the growth of 12-step programs and their being branching out into all different various kinds of uh, compulsions is a sign that, you know, we're, uh, we're improving gradually. So, you know, I think academia is one place where that needs to happen, right? <laughs> also. <laughs> well, I think just the acceptance that trauma is a human experience, and even if it's not our own personal trauma, it's experiencing other people's trauma and, and, and being part of that community of humanity where we work together yeah. to help each each other with our traumas and, and just to yeah. recognize it exists. That, that was a huge step. And it's definitely anti-Aristotelian, right? The, you know, the notion of rational is only one 
or I should say it's anti-platonic in that the rational exists in the opposition of the emotional. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, if you read George Lakoff, uh, Philosophy in the Flesh, mm -hmm. brilliant book. Uh, you know, we have to just revisit all of Western philosophy mm -hmm. because they got it wrong. You know, they were based on this idea that, that the disembodied thought, so we have to have it embodied embodiments, right? That's the fundamental insight, I think. Nancy Tawana does that, too, in several of her books. Uh, she was a philosopher, history of science professor, and coming at it from a f feminist standpoint, and that was back in the 90s. So there's, I studied under her, the less, the less noble, the less noble sex, I think, is the, is the name of the book that was very influential for me. But also what just the name notion, again? Uh, Nancy Tawana, T-U-A-N-A, professor at University of Texas at Dallas, and then went on from there to other places. But the less noble sex was a, a big influence for a lot of us, especially women, graduate students at the time. It took on Western civilization, Western philosophy. Coming, and then the history of philosophy, her retelling of that, going back to even Plato, Aristotle, but following it through the Middle Ages. That was the second book she did. And then she does Plato's Thought, which is a collection of essays about Plato. And the very difficult time feminists have with Plato. You know, the Plato of the Symposium is different from the Plato of Timaeus, for example. Yeah, that's great. That's glad to hear. We got a assaults of Western philosophy on mm -hmm. all on all fronts. Yeah. Whatever front we can, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is what uh, I think Astrid you're working with with uh, Varela. I mean, Varela's work is very important here with the notion of embodied mind, right? That book is so influential. Yeah. A post-phenomenology more generally, which is kind of the contemporary view of things that, you know, not only are you are we embodied, but we are in a network of, you know, animate and inanimate objects and subjects, and it's it's all part of our experience. And yeah, so this is, uh, this is very important. But I mean, speaking about um, that, I guess, I mean, we have a bundle of questions that relate to the plateaus which we haven't really talked about much. And I'd like just like to come back to this idea that, you know, hypertext artists and writers were playing with this idea of, you know, having rhizomatic structures and, and non-arborescent ideas. And, and, and you, you really, I mean, masterfully wove, wove these different ways, styles of writing, these different types of stories together. So Dan had a question about that. Um, I love the hypertext weaving back and forth between different kinds of writing, theory, fable, memoir, all working together. And then Richard also says, um, it seems hypertext seems to encourage this mix of genres, don't you think? Perhaps the sort of compartmentalization effect of writing Lexia leads to different modes of expressing the same things. Is this something you, you wanna just talk a little bit about for us and how, how how does the plateau idea, how you feel the, the plateau idea lends itself? But also, you know, when we talk about, you know, um, Haraway and, and hybridity, which never is really hybridity, never, you know, it's never materialized, at least not to the extent that she was posing. Right. Um, I, you know, the, the, the idea of the plateaus with the idea of genetic uh, helical spire, spiral, kind of spiraling through the plateaus. And those are just kind of two, you know, kind of blending those two metaphors for the interface metaphor uh, was extremely helpful, um, just in terms of organizing it, you know, like I like I did with with linear having a, a linear text because uh, the plateaus are kind of linear if you follow each plateau and I think it just it, it moves you back to the plateau so you could just make it a, a very strictly linear experience and you know, just follow each of those um, plateaus so and but of course the the advantage of, of hypertext which most of it is experienced on the web, right, where you can you have options. You can click on this or that. You can go deeper and, and get 
an explanation or follow a definition or you know see an article or whatever so you know that lends itself to the experience of just a kind of immersion where you get lost in a sense right we've all had the experience hours go by it's like what have i done <laughs> what have i been doing you know this last whatever one two hours uh and it's almost disoriented because you've been floating and, and again this idea of the superficial right where you're skating along a surface is uh in you know thinking of uh literacy as a, a kind of there's an ideology of depth with literacy right where you know being a deep thinker or going deep or you know we have all these kind of metaphorical concepts that we use to to talk about um, you know, being a deep thinker all of this so um, being profound you know profundity I think it just means depth so so you know in some ways the post-structural and the postmodern are ways to uh, elevate the superficial right and to say that that's equally as valuable uh, and you know we, we see that I think and Catherine Hales talks about hyper reading, right? Where you're kind of skating along, you're, you're and that, that that's okay, right? Um, it makes it makes it hard to teach reading, you're, you know, because uh, well, liter literacy is just hard, right? I mean, Omer used to talk about this a lot. You know? Look at how much money we invest in literacy. It, it, what he says is, I love this. He says, this tool, this is a very expensive tool this costs two hundred thousand uh, dollars you know we invest a hundred thousand dollars from k to 12 right approximately fifteen thousand dollars a year times 12 and then another hundred thousand when you go to as an undergraduate and, you know pretty much when you come out as an undergraduate you, you can use this pretty well right <laughs> so you know being literate is is a challenge and um you know there's a like a a neurologist, uh, Marianne Wolf, she writes a book called The Proust and the Squid. And, you know, she, she kind of points out that the brain is not made for literacy. It's just, and she points out, like, where, how we've got to connect all these disparate parts together. So, yeah. Um, can't remember where we started there. Uh, <laughs> it was about the plateaus. Is that, I mean, the, the plateau as a metaphor in its own right doesn't seem to lend itself to interweaving and whatever, right? I mean, it's layered, right? But right. not necessarily like a rhizome. So it's, uh, it's right. just, yeah, I mean, So that's where um, conceiving of the plateaus as like the, the, the um, I can't remember what they're called, but the adenine and the guanine, you know, when they connect and then you spiral down and, and the next pair and how the, the pairs. Mm -hmm. So if you actually yeah. just picture the um, chromosome, and and then you know, so you have you have a linear, but then you have a a, a vertical or a, a traversal or kind of a spiraling down. So mm -hmm. yeah, oh, that's so fascinating. Um, Dinu, how are we doing for time? I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Who would like to ask another question? I'm not seeing anything in the uh, chats right now. Uh, okay. Richard, uh, there was also a bit of a discussion about uh, lexias, nodes, spaces, and something mm -hmm. that you uniquely, as, a, as an Eastgate published author, call cells. So cell, a cell is a single unit of narrative for you. And at some point in the story, you, you also call for uh, uh, you invoke a, a body of uh, of text, so uh, single cells, uh, single uh, lexias are cells, and the whole text is a body. And at the same time, there was also a mentioning about uh, uh, palace of memory. Yeah. How do you combine these metaphors uh, in 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 the, in the relation of the uh, single unit to the whole? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, because yeah, the memory palace was very, very central to all of my work. Um, and you know, just you know, Omer's thinking of the technologies of 
of communication as you know these are mnemonic prosthetics right they're they're prostheses for our memory so that uh, you know how did it used to be uh, you know this is electricity 101 and i i deliver this to middle school students you know um in oral culture we remember in our brain but you know, the, the, the shaman dies and all that gets lost so in literacy we put our memory out on into to, to text form right it's on stones it's on paper it's on papyrus whatever so with, um, with literacy we put it into digital form so but you know throughout the idea of the memory palace uh, the, or in the memory palace is is an oral form right it goes back to the, the greeks and you know training uh, for rhetoricians but it's a three-dimensional space so uh and and they um and i think you know the um the metaphor i used was the cell was the latin means room or storeroom right so it's like where you store uh, information right? and it, it's also how our body stores the information right so it's the cell is is pivotal so uh, it's you know basically reaching into the sciences for our our um our compositional practice you know it's trying to open up uh interdisciplinary pathways for you know for the humanities and that was another you know i think great advantage of Ulmer's approach to uh the work of scholarship you know, he's always looking to bridge disciplines and always looking outside of humanities for inspiration and for uh, you know, uh, something that's that's rich that's the, the richness of the metaphor and and that's that was it, as I read about um, genetics and learned about it there's you know some quotes about it but, you know, it's like there's four different levels. I, I, I can't find the quote now, but there's like four different levels. And it's like, yeah, that almost like matches you know, Dante's theory of allegory there. It's like almost maps perfectly. Uh, so it's fascinating stuff, right? And um, I think that's, that's where we need to go. We want to open things up. So... Um, so the memory palace is, is really big. And, you know, the, what's interesting to me is my dissertation, which was written in, finished it in 94, and it, it, what it, the way I describe it to people is that it's basically posits a, a, a three-dimensional writing space. So the idea of using the memory palace as a way to organize information. So, you know, if we're thinking about a writing space in three dimensions, the, my key insight was that the web is a three-dimensional space that we could write in, or a hypertext is a three-dimensional space. So it has the potential if we think of it like that. But now we have augmented reality and virtual reality, right? Which is like literally three-dimensional. So that's that, that's where the cutting edge is, I think. I haven't, I'm not up on the scholarship, but I think um, that's where, you know, where I would like to be working. Anybody wants to offer me a job, I'm, I'm available. You want to pay me enough to buy a book every now and then, and uh, I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll do this work. Uh, and it was fun. I did a little work at Emerson College as an adjunct with uh, John Craig Freeman, who, um, who worked with Ulmer. And you know, it was great to have. It was in the graduate program, so the, the MFA program, and it was great to have students to just experiment with you know like and that, that's what Omar did with me he's like he brings it out to the the edge the cutting edge and he says you know here we are on the frontier it's a, we are the avant-garde and you know go forth and uh invent <laughs> experiment and play and let's figure this out together right like elevating the student to the level of uh inventor and saying you know we you, know, you don't need to have the depth of knowledge that I have as a professor. You have what it takes to help 
uh, create this new frontier. Um, and uh, that's the value of his work, and that's what uh, makes it all so exciting. I was thinking, Richard, the other day, someone asked me about virtual reality. We have virtual reality courses and headsets and all of that here. And more and more, I'm moving away from the notion of virtual reality and separating it and having a virtual world, which is not necessarily skeuomorphic in nature, that, that maybe even Almer's idea of electricity would disconnect reality from virtual so that we can recreate a new space in the virtual that is not representing the space that we're currently in. And that's the question I've been asking myself more and more in the last months, is what would virtual mean if we're not trying to make it mimic what we're doing currently in our everyday lives? Can we do something new and different? And what would right. that look like? That's, that's yeah. means a, a sexier um, idea of approaching virtual than trying to like recreate a mountaintop that I'm standing on. No, absolutely. No, and that's, you know, having the freedom to experiment yeah. there. But I think we need, um, it's almost like there's that book called Remediation, uh, that where I think Bolter maybe was involved with that. Yeah, this is book is in a gruesome. Yeah, we, we, need to, we need to bridge from what we know, right? Because it, it's just too hard to go to invent this stuff. Well, when can we yeah. jump? I mean, when can we make I, that leap? Do you know the book, book If Monks Had Max? Yes, you know, that, yes. That text. You know, I, I talk about that in my dissertation because, you know, it's just funny. Um, we're reusing this book metaphor in the, in the hypertext set. So, but, um, yeah, so there's, there's, uh, that, that's, that's very exciting to think about. Um, and, but, you know, on the other hand, I read all these works of philosophy and I see spatial metaphors, you know, metaphorical concepts underlying them. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the metaphor in Lakoff's um, philosophy in the flesh is that the, uh, the mind is a body moving through space. And that's the core metaphor. So, uh, you know, it gets to the point, Smith. Uh, you know, and, and what I want to do is play with that and say, well, let's, let's, let's play with that mathematically. Let's, let's stretch the point out into a line or let's make it a square or a, a cube or a hypercube. You know, get to the line or get to the cube, Smith. Um, and I add dimensions to what we're trying to do. So, uh, but but it's uncanny. I mean, I see this in Derrida, Deleuze, you know, all of the fun, fundamental thinkers. We fall back on these metaphors. We call them dead metaphors. And, and what I would like to see is, can we consciously use these metaphors to, um, to kind of think differently, right? If we were aware of how we think spatially, then um, how would that change our thinking? And that is, <laughs> that's the frontier I'm on, and would you know love to have a graduate class uh, helping me figure that out, because that's that's the new frontier. I'm just sorry to interrupt here, but I just noticed we have Stella Wisdom from the British Library here. I think. If, if this is the, the stellar wisdom I know. So yes. I just wanted to say hi, this is awesome, <laughs> so wonderful. And we have a few more um, questions, Dini, uh, can we ask a couple more? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we have a bit further up, there was something from Kathleen. I'm curious to hear your personal take on the pros of hypertext as a mode of self-reflection. And maybe you can um, link this to Dan's, which um, in which he asked. So, if, if you were if you were to write, you know, Janetis today, what I mean, how would you approach it? Would you approach it differently, knowing, you know, all the technologies that are that are out there? Would you still choose this kind of format, or do you think something else would be more appropriate? I hope I've interpreted both questions appropriately. Well, that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, the, the work I've done since then is using a software called Inform7 to tell yeah. internet <laughs> fiction. So, um, so I've got this story I've been working on for 10 years trying to um, finish that thing. 
and it actually, you know, has some of these themes in it. So, but um, I'm I'm very I'm kind of interested in this where we, we have text, but we also have um, thinking in terms of three dimensional spaces, or with three dimensional spaces, or in three dimensional spaces, right? So, uh, how do we do that? And but then with interactive fiction, you have the narrative that you're also trying to incorporate into the process too. So, um, how does storytelling become a form of uh, mnemonic, right? How does that how does that work? Um, so, uh, in terms of self reflection, I think. Hypertext is, is um, I think it's always useful. It, it's very, it's core, it's fundamental to the, you know, emergence of electronic, you know, the era of electricity. Um, and actually, I, I did develop something for Mark Bernstein. He wanted to show off hypertext at a conference a year or two ago. So, so I created something in Twine where I was using some of these concepts again the ideas of uh, the mixtures with mud lava bubble dust and I created this like um, like psychological questionnaire with these bizarre questions and then it kind of you fill it out and then you're it, uh, it says you know, oh you're a, you're a bubble uh, your, your personality is bubble and then it kind of suggests what your life is going to be like or what happened or. so and i was able to integrate uh images and text and you know there's multiple pathways and with that i actually had a uh, boolean operator so i was working with um some computational thinking i guess you'd say or algorithms trying to integrate that so for me i'm a computer science teacher now and would like to be able to Create texts that work with, work with the program that have programs involved. So, so what happens to self-reflection when you are, you know, you've got algorithms that are coming involved? Um, so, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think I could just still value to hypertext, you know, because it's multilinear writing and lets you create a landscape. For the reader to traverse. Yeah, we're using it, and um, you know, we we have been using it uh, as an intervention tool for um, young people um, dealing with body image issues. For them wow. to create different paths or different decisions and ways of thinking about their bodies that they don't usually consider, and just going all the way. Take that take that thought all the way, right? But what about if I don't look in the mirror this morning? Does it maybe make a difference or something like that, right? So just being able to explore these different options and and um, and they found that empowering. I mean, it's not a great word, but they, you know, overall, if the um, the feedback was was positive, very positive. Yeah, that's that's, that's really important work to be doing, you know. Mm, and that's, uh, yeah. Kudos to you on for that, because yeah, um, trying to get young people to <laughs> how to think, how to process, you know, how to how to run through. I didn't do a lot of that when I was younger, so. Well, we, we didn't really have the tools, and, and story space was very, very expensive. <laughs> it wasn't available to just anyone, and yeah, I mean. <laughs> we, yeah. Weren't, we weren't allowed now, to like do that because it was I've considered used. bad, right? I mean, any kind of therapy was considered a mental problem, and then you could just be put away. That was the fear of talking about those things, right? Yeah, that too. Yeah. Taboo, right? It it's important that that we bring this out and make it, you know, more part of our lives that we really, sort of, you know, yeah. thematize these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, um, because Stella is here, um, she um, she asked something about games. Like, what about literary and dramatic performances in online gaming worlds like Minecraft and Grand Theft Auto? That was in in relation to um, the virtual reality discussion that we had. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure um, whether I, refer, uh, you know, framed this correctly. Stella, you can uh, feel free to write more in the chat if, um, you know, if you want to add to that. 
But obviously that's also like, you know, open open worlds, like sandboxy type games are also a way of experiencing and making stories, creating the cinema type um, movies, uh, sort of animated movies and things like that. Um, that's also a way, right? Of no, I, yeah, I, I did um, spend some time in Second Life back mm -hmm. from 2006 to 2009. And uh, as uh, Deanie was talking back then, I, I, I do recall this one avatar that was quite remarkable. It was a, a person whose like head was like the spinning cosmos with, uh, with a, a galaxy. And it was just so different. It was so startling and different. And I never forgot it, right? So, um, so the potential for self-expression uh, in the in the medium is is quite powerful. And uh, I am recalling also an essay, and I'm not going to remember the the, the author, uh, but I, I could probably dig it up somewhere. But it was basically a an appeal to employ, you know, metaphor as a way to, you know, again, self, self-expression, uh, exploration, um, you know, like what if you were, your avatar was, you were a flame at some point, some of that in there, but it, that seems uh, trite uh, in, in what I'm remembering the impact of, of her, uh, her suggestion was, so. Uh, I'd like to find that because I think that was a that was a really interesting suggestion that she made. Uh, but yeah, you know, performance, uh, you know, wearing these masks, in a sense, you know, uh, your your avatar, and and you get to be who you, where you want to be, right? There's the cartoon with the dog, you know, and nobody knows I'm a dog on the internet, right? That's the famous one. So, uh, you know, my, um, another line of thinking I had was how do we, how do we think differently, right? So if we have, um, uh, if, if, if we're thinking is getting, uh, what I, how I put this, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm not gonna remember, but the but part of it was, you know, just being deceptive, you know, in, in that idea where you can uh, oh decepts like we have concepts we think conceptually in literacy. So what if we thought deceptual, right, or reception, right. or inception, right? So we play with the word. This is part of what Omer likes to do, right? Let's invent new processes. So. What if, what if we have decepts, right? So when you adopt a character and you have a, an avatar and you're in a different gender, then you're being deceptive to some extent. But how can that help us think differently, right? That's the goal. How do we think differently? How do we have a fresh approach to thinking? And how can electronic, how can electronic media help us to do that? That's really what we need. Yeah. Well, that's such a rich uh, discussion that um, we will undoubtedly keep going. <laughs> it's it's what fascinates us. It's what keeps us in the field and and you know invigorates us all um, permanently. Richard, um, I just want to thank you so much for being with us, for sharing all this and and more and. Um, yeah, bearing with us. I've, I've learned so much just in this session and the rehearsal earlier this week. And um, I will reread your work again and again. And I hope, I really hope the copyright issue can be fixed at some point so that we can actually teach this work. I, I see, I mean, I see a potential that, that it may become as, as sort of instructive and on many layers and for many groups of people as Patchwork Girl has been, as like a, you know, a symbol of a time and um, and also very readable symbol. So, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, and all the work y'all are doing to, you know, preserve this and archive it. You know, it's it's something we didn't think about when we were creating it, and you know, I 
I have work that's lost, you know, my early web pages. I was experimenting with that, you know, early hypertexts that are just gone um, and not available. So it's it's sad to think that there's this, you know, these extinctions, <laughs> right, um, at the textual level. So, um, so uh, really grateful for all that you're, you all are doing. So thank you. Thanks for inviting me to do this. It's, it's a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. All right, so we'd like to make an announcement. On next Friday, we have Kathy Mack, who will be performing a Natural Habitats. And I believe, um, Astrid, you're going to be moderating that one as well. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. join us again next week. We're starting at 11 o'clock next Friday, and we'll be at the same channel, youtube.com slash c slash electronic literature lab. So come back and catch one more traversal. Houston recommend uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery 4 computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Gillespugin.